In this unit, we are going to cover telecommunications and networking. And this has become uh, a very important topic in courses like this, especially recent events as I record this in, in uh, 2020, right in the middle of COVID-19. So let's get started and talk about telecommunications and networking and how it uh, relates to management information systems. So in this unit, we're gonna talk about what exactly is a computer network. I'm gonna give you some network fundamentals. We'll talk about the internet and the World Wide Web, which of course are different things. And we'll talk about different applications of networks. So how we actually use them and how they support information systems. So we'll compare and contrast the major types of networks, describe the wireline communications, media and transmission technologies. So just specific about technologies and then describe most common methods for accessing the internet and explain the impact that networks have had on business and of course our everyday lives in the uh, six major categories that we'll discuss. So first, what is a computer network? I'm gonna talk about what exactly a computer network is. We'll talk about what bandwidth is in broadband, local area networks, wide area networks, enterprise networks, just some basic vernacular uh, to get you familiar with some of the terminology. Some of you may have had networking classes previously, and if you have, uh, certainly a lot of this will be review. Um, so you know, feel free to skip ahead if you think you've seen a lot of this stuff before, but let's go ahead and get started talking about computer networks. So uh, first we'll talk about the internet. Um, you know, prior to the internet, right? Uh, the internet, one of the genius, uh, elegantly simple, simplistic, but genius things about the internet is this, this mesh of, uh, of, uh, network nodes that creates the internet, right? In, in the early days, this was a kind of a groundbreaking philosophy, right? So the idea was, you know, let's say you had a computer, uh, in Washington, DC, you had another computer at a national lab over in California, right? And let's say you're the department of defense and you need to link up these two, right? For, you know, important national security reasons. Well, one of the problems is if that line were to be severed, right? If that connection between those two points were severed, you would have no way to communicate. But what if I took another connection point somewhere in Texas and I connected those to both endpoints? You can see now I have multiple paths to get data to and from Washington, DC and California. Likewise, I could put another path in Minnesota, right? And I can interconnect those. And I use that term interconnect, right? Because these all are interconnected, right? And I can even connect these two together. And you can start to see the more nodes I have that are interconnected to one another, the more paths I have to move data between these points. It makes the internet, right? The, this is the concept the internet is, is more or less based off of, but it basically makes the internet much more impervious to failure, right? Because a single, you know, severed connection is not going to bring down the whole internet. You know, the internet if you think about computer networks prior to internet technologies, right? The internet protocol and some of the other technologies we'll talk about, it was a little bit more like Christmas lights, right? Uh, you know, you go out to the store and you buy Christmas lights, one bulb goes out, they all go out, right? Um, and that's kind of how networks worked back in the old days. And the internet comes along and sort of changes that. Now, what allowed that to happen, what allowed networks to change is this concept of routing, right? This idea that, nodes don't exist simply to service the users within their own network, but can also exist to transfer information between other networks, right? So you can kind of move data along through your node, right? This whole idea of routing, of being a router. Uh, and that, that's really kind of a groundbreaking principle back in the 70s and, and late 60s that really gave way to the internet that we know today that really kind of took off in the 80s. And of course, as a lot of you probably know, the concept of the internet was developed by DARPA, which is a Department of Defense research um, projects, right? And they later kind of transferred all that intellectual property to the public domain uh, where it exists today. And, you know, pretty much all of our, you know, all of our network communications is all grounded and based on what you see here from the original uh, ARPANET, right? Uh, which was the civilian version of DARPA that, uh, that created the internet. All right, so let's talk about some of the different uh, uh, some of the different local area network technologies, right? I talked about this kind of wide area network with the whole internet, right, as a whole across the country. But how do we move data across wires, right? How do we actually do that? This isn't just local area. This is wide area. This is kind of all networking technologies, right? How does this work? And uh, the first concept is twisted pair and, and coaxial fiber optic, right? You have these different uh, mediums that you can use to encode data. Well, let's talk about what this actually looks like. So let's say I had the number 
180. We're going to try to keep this simple, right? Because at the end of the day, all, all data is really just ones and zeros, right? So let's say I've got these, you know, this, uh, this, uh, eight bit, um, you know, binary number that I need to transmit over a wire, right? So the first step is I need to encode that. So let's say I've got a piece of copper that connects two computers. Well, the easy way to encode this is I would use positive and negative voltage over time. And at a certain interval in time, I would switch between the next, you know, the previous bit and the next bit, right? So first I use positive voltage to indicate that it's a one. And then the next time tick, I do a zero. The next time tick, I do a one. Then the next time tick, a one. And whoever's listening on the other side could, could sort of detect that positive and negative voltage and determine whether it should be a zero or a one, right? This is a relatively simple way of encoding data electronically or, or you know, digitally on a wire, right? On a copper wire. But let's say a couple of things could happen here, right? Let's say first, you know, I've got a relatively short wire on my screen, but what if that's a really long copper wire? Well, one of the problems with a really long copper wire is that over a longer distance, that signal is going to be very weak, right? So now it becomes very difficult to discern between a zero or a one because it's very difficult to measure that increasingly weak signal over longer distances. And that concept is known as attenuation. So if you've taken a physics class, you may have learned about attenuation, right? So the more resistance we have, the longer the wire, you get more attenuation. It becomes more difficult to measure that voltage on the other side of the wire, right? The current that's, uh, that's applied to that, to that copper wire. So, so that limits us a little bit in the distance that we can run these wires. As it turns out with twisted pair, copper twisted pair, we're limited to about a hundred meters in distance. Um, so that's, that's about the limit that we can, that we can, you know, that's a couple football fields, right? So we really can't go much more than a hundred meters before attenuation, uh, really starts to cause problems. And there's actually some tricks to make that work. Even at that distance, uh, they use twisted pair, which helps reduce the attenuations where you take two wires and you twist them and they help, uh, they help minimize the electrical interference that happens between multiple wires that are in this, within the same shielding and also from external sources, right? Um, so a couple of tricks they do there. Now, here's the other problem is let's say you do have a nice short wire, but you want to send data really, really fast, right? The faster we can send data, the better. So what if we tried to squeeze that time frame, right? That tick of the clock, we try to make it a much shorter time frame. Well, as you can see here, you know, at a glance, it becomes again, much more difficult to measure those changes between the positive and negative voltage. It happened with, it happens too fast. You can start missing those changes. And then we have another problem, right? Um, so that could be difficult. So these technologies that I'm describing here, right, that, that using twisted pair, coaxial and, and fiber optic uh, to encode data, this is um, baseband technologies, right? So you hear the term baseband. Uh, it's, a, it's a very little encoding of data on some medium, right? We don't really use a lot of tricks to try to do anything to get that data to move any faster. It's, um, you know, there are some, you know, technologies. I, you know, in this class, I don't want to get into details here on these IEEE standards, but I'm just trying to give you a very basic idea here of, you know, what this looks like, right? And what the challenges are. So that's baseband technologies. And, you know, and again, the, 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 limit, the limiting factors here with baseband technologies is distance um, and also to some extent speed because of the way that these technologies work, right? So a couple different challenges. Now, here's another way you can encode data, right? So let's say I have, um, you know, let's say I want to encode the, the number 180, uh, you know, I can convert um, those ones and zeros to a decimal 180. And then I plot that point on a graph and that's my first byte, right? So here I have in the first time tick, instead of encoding a single bit, what if I encode eight bits, an entire byte in that first tick of the clock, right? So now instead of eight ticks to encode one byte, I can do it in one tick because I plot that point. And I keep plotting points, right? So then every tick, I plot the next eight bits or a byte. And a byte, um, if you recall, is a number between, you know, a decimal between zero and 255 is one byte, right? Those eight ones and zeros between zero and 255 when you calculate the binary equivalent, or the decimal equivalent of the binary, right? Now, if I take all those points and I plot them and then I can draw, you know, a, a, a sound wave and play that sound, and that's what that raw data would sound like, right? It, it, I could, I could you know, apply, you know, take that electrical signal and use that to drive a speaker to play a sound if I wanted to, right? And I could do the opposite, right? So here's my sound waves that are, by the way, we call that modulation, right? When we take that data and we turn it into another 
another medium like sound, we call that modulation. And when it gets to the other side, another speaker is listening and it's, you know, magnet is vibrating to those vibrations and it's generating an electrical signal, right? So here's the electrical signal that gets generated. And then what we do is something called sampling, where we sample that signal, right? So we keep drawing points to sample that signal and that's known as demodulation. When we take a signal in some medium and we sample it to basically get those ones and zeros again, right? Um, and that's really, of course, the uh, the etymology of the term modem, which most of you have probably heard the term modem, right? It's modulating and then demodulating. If any of you are old enough to remember in the old days, you would have a modem uh, connected to your phone line. And if you picked up the phone while somebody was on the internet, you would hear a bunch of noise. And that noise that you're hearing is literally modulated data, right? That's what you're hearing. And it, of course, it doesn't sound like anything, right? Um, you know, it doesn't sound like anything meaningful. It's just a bunch of noise, but it means something to the computer that's that's hearing that essentially, right? It's 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 demodulating that to turn it into data, right? Um, now, a couple problems with this, you know, well, first of all, the kind of cool thing about this is we can encode a lot more data in much less time when we modulate it like this. Uh, and in this case, in this example, I'm choosing to modulate it using sound waves, right? Using the vibrations of sound to, you know, to basically manipulate a speaker to or a, a microphone to generate that electrical signal that we can then sample, right? In a very basic example. And in fact, if you go back in time, you look at old movies, you know, there's this great old movie called War Games where he has an old modem uh, attached to an MSA computer. And you'll see in the movie that when he calls computers, he literally takes a telephone, dials the number and puts the phone on two cups that are that are going to receive that that phone, right? So it's you're literally putting a phone into these cups that are making the noises and listening for signals, right? Um, so this isn't too far off from how modems actually worked in the old days. But, um, you know, while we can encode the data much faster, take a look at this example here. So here I've, I've used a much wider bandwidth, right? So what I've done is I you know, instead of from uh, encoding data from zero to 255, what if I can encode even larger numbers and use, you know, add a lot more amplitude, right? So this is more ampli going back to your physics class, right? And hopefully you've taken a physics class, you learned about amplitude, right? With signals. So I can add a lot more amplitude to send a lot more data a lot faster, right? Um, but if you think about it, you know, look at, I, I was talking about that old movie from the 1980s, 1984, actually, War Games, starring Matthew Broderick, I recommend it if you haven't seen it. Um, but in that movie, he's using a phone line. And here's the challenge with telephones. Have you ever played music for somebody over a telephone, right? And if you have, you probably know that most phones, um, they don't really play music very well. They're really good at carrying the human voice, Right. And the human voice, basically, most human voices occur in a very narrow range of amplitude and frequency, right? Um, so, so recreating the human voice through a telephone, that's what the telephone system was designed for. It was designed to carry the human voice. It was not designed to carry music and other, you know, and video and things like that. So, um, so a computer, if it's trying to send too much, right, if that frequency range is too is too large, right? If the bandwidth is too large, what happens is the telephone company says, well, we only carry, uh, you know, uh, uh, vibrations through this very narrow band, right? So it clips everything. So it kind of, that's what really limits us with old modems, right? With telephone lines. So on paper, while this looks like it could be really fast, old telephone lines, you know, like traditional telephone lines, they really can't carry data that fast. So we have to use other technologies. Um, and we call this narrow band, right? So but, but you may have heard the term broadband. And broadband is when we don't have the shackles of limited range, limited frequency. It's when we can use that full frequency uh, you know, and, and, and more amplitude to send a signal. And that's really when you use technologies like DSL on the low end of the spectrum, uh, kind of in the medium end, you've got cable, uh, you know, like your cable TV company, which of course is built for carrying high bandwidth, right? Because it's tons of channels of video. Um, high definition video. It's a tremendous amount of data. So what if we use some of those channels for, you know, for, for internet, right? And that's essentially what, you know, how that technology works. Um, you've also got fiber optic, which is, uh, you know, like Verizon Fios or something like that. There's other, other providers. 
Um, those are broadband technologies. You know, and fiber obviously is probably the fastest, right? Cable's getting up there, um, but they have to do some tricks to get it that fast. But it's a lot of this modulation and demodulation that's happening to make all that possible, right? No one's really encoding raw ones and zeros on wires, you know, to send it over these vast distances. Um, there's also a lot of multiplexing that's happening, right? That's where lots of different people are using that same uh, connection point, right? So you share the internet with everybody in your neighborhood, right? Eventually it goes to some trunk where it all gets combined uh, until it gets to the next hop, right? So, um, you know, it's not like you have your own dedicated connection to the internet backbone, right? We share that. And then the internet backbone itself is shared amongst many, many people, right? You think about the fiber optic cables that go across the Atlantic Ocean. There's not 5,000 of them, right? There's very few of those wires that cross all the way across the ocean. Uh, in fact, there's a picture on the internet somewhere. I wish I had it in my PowerPoint. I just thought of it. But, uh, you know, there's a picture on the internet where like 90% of the traffic between Europe and the United States comes into New York City. Um, and it's like a wire that's maybe this big, right? And it, it you know, comes into a little nondescript building somewhere in uh, in New Jersey. Um, so that's it, right? So you'll hear the term baseband, narrowband, broadband, and this is really what we're talking about. So connecting to the internet, there's a variety of ways to connect to the internet. Uh, I just talked about dial-up, which is, you know, the old-fashioned way, 56,000 bits per second. That's about the limit with uh, with dial-up, with a traditional telephone, like I have hanging on the wall behind me back here, which you probably can't see, right? There's just an old-fashioned telephone. They can handle about 56,000 bits per second. It sounds like a lot, 56,000, but technologies like DSL... 256,000 bits per second, significantly more than dial-up. But then we go to things like cable, and in theory, you can send 50 billion bits per second, right? But nobody does that, of course, but that's the theoretical limit. Um, I think the reality is most of us are, have service with Comcast or something like that, where you might be getting 100 million bits per second, right? Um, and then you have fiber optic, right? Which in theory is even faster than cable internet right but look how much faster that is than dial-up right it's uh it's an unbelievably huge jump from dial-up to these other technologies but then satellite we kind of take a step back um satellite for upload is really not much better than dial-up and then for download it certainly is a little bit faster um satellite of course is much more useful when you're in a very isolated area you know up on a mountain or something like that somewhere where running this physical infrastructure like fiber optic and cable just isn't feasible, right? So that's where people typically will use satellite. And then finally you have WiMAX. WiMAX is when we basically use our cell phone for the internet. And interestingly, uh, from an information systems perspective, this is becoming really, really common, right? Uh, there are more and more people who do not have cable internet at home. They don't have fiber optic at home. They simply have a smartphone and they say, you know what, I can get unlimited internet on my smartphone. I don't have another device in my home, so I don't need to pay for a Comcast internet, right? They just use their smartphone um, or they're connecting through their smartphone and it's getting faster and faster. Now with talk about, um, you know, uh, uh, 5G internet, which is going to be super, super fast. Uh, there's uh, Tesla, which is launching these satellites that, uh, not Tesla, but, uh, you know, uh, Elon Musk's company, I can't recall the name of it, right? Launching satellites that are going to create this mesh network of satellite internet. Um, you know, that's that's really kind of an example of WiMAX um, because of the way it works. It's low Earth orbit, so it's a little different than satellite. But the um, but the idea is that, that this is becoming more and more common. So in the future, we may be in a scenario where, most of us aren't paying for internet at home. It's just it's just there, right? It's in the air and available to us anywhere we are, and it's pretty darn fast. And you know, think about it with your phones today. You know, you can watch YouTube videos on your phone on cell signal, and it's really not that slow, right? It, everything loads pretty fast. You can watch a movie on Netflix through the internet. Um, I do it all the time. I used to sit on the train and watch, uh, you know, Amazon or Netflix videos to pass the time on a six-hour train ride, and it was like nothing, right? It worked fine. It's until you go through a tunnel or something, right? Now, one thing I want you to remember about all this is that um, Wi-Fi is not a method of connecting to the internet. Wi-Fi is a method of connecting to a local area network. So if I asked you on a test, what are some examples of ways to connect to the internet? The, the ones that everything you see on the left are ways to connect to the internet. Wi-Fi is a way to connect to a local area network, which we're gonna talk about shortly.
All right, so let's talk about local area networks. Um, going back to the old days, it was a very simple technology a uh, long, long time ago where you would have computers in a network that were all connected to a single bus, right? So it was a long wire that they all interconnected to. And you can think of it kind of like Christmas lights. I talked about that earlier, right? It's like a string of Christmas lights. Um, and this is called a bus network or a bus topology network. And the challenge with the bus topology network is that if any one of these computers failed, none of them would work, right? So everything had to be working for these to work. So it was pretty primitive and these didn't really last that long. Very quickly, companies like IBM came up with better ideas like Token Ring, right? Which is a ring-based topology. The idea is that all the computers are interconnected in a ring and there's a token that's passed from computer to computer. Um, and you know, when they have the token, it's their turn to encode a message on this ring and everyone just passes that message around. Um, and that was really kind of the prevailing technology in the late seventies into the early eighties. And around 1981, uh, John Postel writes a, you know, a paper about um, networks and a star topology uh, using the internet protocol. And the idea with a star topology is that you add a device that sits in the middle, and I'm sorry, you can't read the word there, but it's called a switch, right? So that device in the middle is a switch and all of the computers on the network connect to that switch. Uh, now in the old days, that used to be something called a hub. I'm not even gonna talk about that because you just won't see hubs anymore, right? Um, but all the computers connect to this sort of centralized wiring device. In the old days, a hub, today it's a switch. Um, and because they're all interconnected, if any one of those computers fails or has a problem, it doesn't affect anyone else on the network because everybody has their own wire connecting to that central wiring device. So that's known as a star topology. And that is by far the prevailing technology for local area networking today. You really won't see any other technology other than star. And students will say, wait a minute, Brian, what about Wi-Fi? That's not a wire uh, that's connecting to a central wiring device. Well, think about it. Your Wi-Fi router is one device that everyone connects to. Everyone has an independent connection to that wireless router. So that is still a star topology, even though it's wireless, right? Because it's all connecting to that one device. In fact, they still call it a switch, right? A Wi-Fi switch, um, you know, that everybody's connecting to. So that's a star topology. Now, what happens with these star topologies is that if you have multiple star topology networks, so multiple you know, switches or hubs. And like I said, you won't really see hubs anymore, but multiple switches all interconnected. Now, most of us in our homes, we have a switch um, that then connects to a modem that goes out to the internet through, you know, a router or something like that. Um, but if you were in a, in a moderately sized, you know, network that has more than one switch, those switches have to be interconnected to one another. And typically it's a router that's doing that. Now, some of you that are, you know, networking people are going to, in class, you'd be putting your hands up and saying, Brian, it's not always a router that we use to do that. We use uh, um, L3 switches, right? But um, but conceptually, L3 switches really work like a router, right? Uh, even though they're still a switch, they they actually are, are working as if they're a router. So I'm still going to call this a router in my diagram, even though sometimes there's switches. I don't want to confuse everyone here with the vernacular, right? Um, so a router is what interconnects different star networks, right? Or switches, if you will. We don't use bus or ring topology anymore, right? They're, they're really kind of gone today. You might find a few old IBM networks still using a ring topology, but um, for the most part, we refer to these star networks as local area networks, right? The L is for local. Um, so these are usually a, a finite area, you know, they're not over a large geography, but if I wanted to interconnect two lands together, that are over a large geography, we call that a wide area network. So anytime different networks are interconnected, right? So we have different networks interconnected through routers, that's a wide area network. That's the textbook definition, not in our textbook, but you know the general textbook definition of a wide area network, all right? So that's some of the vernacular you're gonna wanna know for, for this class, if you're taking a test, I might ask you to describe a bus topology, a ring topology, and a star topology. Understand that a local area network uh, is a collection of devices in a in a star topology, typically with a with a switch in the middle. And when you interconnect different local area networks through a router, you typically have a WAN, especially when it's over a large geographic area. Now, within these local area networks or corporate networks, you're going to have different types of devices. Um, so traditionally, when we have lots of computers on a network, we call it a peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, 
everyone is an equal, right? We're all interconnected to each other. We're all equals to one another. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes here, but that would be a peer-to-peer -peer network. However, in corporate networks, we typically add something called a server. And the server's job is to provide some services on the network, two types that you might hear me talk about in the class. One would be a, uh, a network information server or, a, or a, a network server. And this would be things like managing user accounts, managing printers and things like that, and shared resources and all the shared resources on the network, you know, being managed usually uh, domain name services and email and things like that. And then you also have servers for sharing files, right? Like a file server. Uh, and when we have a network that contains both servers that are providing services to users on the network and clients, right? Um, the clients who are using those services, it's a client server network. In 99% of corporate networks, you have a client server network. Typically, we say if you have more than 10 computers on a network or 10 devices, I should say, right? Because the concept of computers is really kind of antiquated, right? Your computer, your, your books talks about computers on a network, right? But you know, more often than not, what we actually have are devices, right? If you think about all the different things that connect to the internet today, your TV connects to the internet, you know, your microwave can connect to the internet and your, and your refrigerator and so forth, right? This internet of things, you know, my thermostat in my house connects to the uh, internet, right? Um, and even my, you know, my electrical box connects to the internet and I can real time monitor electricity in my home, right? Um, so lots of things, but what the rule of thumb is, if you have 10 devices, usually we say that it, it makes sense to have a client server network when you have more than 10 devices. I think that number should be changed uh, from a recommendation to 10 because I think about your home. Um, most of us don't have servers in our home, but most of us have a lot more than 10 devices, right? I'm thinking in my head, you know, we've got a TV that connects to the internet. We've got the, the PlayStation that connects to the internet that the kids use. I've got, uh, you know, a thermostat and I've got my electrical grid stuff. And then I've got you know, three or four laptops, uh, you know, that I've used for work. And then my kids each have a laptop. My wife has a laptop. They all have phones. Some of us have a tablet, right? I'm already up to about 15 or 16 devices. And I think that's pretty common, right? And a lot of you probably have refrigerators that connect to the internet and all kinds of stuff, light bulbs and smart houses and so forth and so on, right? So that number 10 probably isn't a great uh, a great number to use anymore, right? But for the most part, um, you know, once you get reach a certain number of devices that have to be managed, uh, it makes a lot of sense to convert to a client server network, which is where you, what you'll find in most organizations that use information systems. They're typically going to have a uh, client server network. So some different technologies that we can use in a LAN to interconnect computers. You'll hear the term twisted pair. There's lots of different technologies uh, for twisted pair. This is what it looks like. You've got a bunch of wires, uh, usually eight wires that are that, that are in sets of uh, two. So you have four sets of two wires that are twisted. And those twists are actually a little bit different each twist. I talked earlier about attenuation, and that's really to help prevent that interference and attenuation. And the, the more insulation you have and the more and the higher the quality of manufacturing, the more data you can carry on a wire. And that's where you get these different uh, types of Ethernet wires that you can buy, right? They can support different speeds. Uh, Cat3 is very slow. Cat5 is pretty typical. Cat5e is, is pretty good with your, you know, one gigabit per second. And then Cat6, of course, is even faster. It's the, the best you can buy right now as far as copper wire goes. Then there's Cat 6A and Cat 7, which is not very common, but you'll see Cat 6 in the store, right? If you go to Home Depot or something, and you know it's amazing, you can go to Home Depot now and buy this stuff, right? It was unthinkable 10 years ago. Everybody sells this stuff now. Um, then you have coaxial, which is typical for you know like your cable company is coaxial, but local area networks also used to use coaxial. It's not very common anymore, uh, but it used to be a long time ago. You'd have coax because it can carry more data. Um, you know, than, than using twisted pair. But again, you had to do some modulation for that. Uh, and then you've got uh, fiber optic, right? So which is the other option. Um, different, cut. you know, usually if you see a uh, twisted pair ethernet, the jack looks like a telephone jack, right? These are called RJ11, RJ14, RJ25 or typical telephone jacks, but data is typically, um, so that'd be telephone, but data is typically an RJ45. It's a much larger looking telephone jack and it can hold basically all eight wires. Not all eight are actually used for data networks, though, which is kind of interesting. All right, so some advantages to networks. One, 
is uh, using networks, of course, helps us reduce costs. We can share resources, right? So we can share applications, we can share printers, you know, all that kind of stuff. I was actually uh, with somebody not long ago and they were telling me this story about how, um, you know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, he had a friend that owned a small business and um, they they wanted to start using computers, you know, and they use computers in their business, but they wanted to have a network and he was worried about, people connecting to the internet and, you know, getting viruses and stealing all their data. And of course, this is back in the old days when, uh, you know, a, there was a case in the 90s where a federal judge was convinced that Kevin Mitnick, a famous hacker who was in federal prison, you can read about him, uh, they convinced the judge that he could whistle into a phone to launch nuclear bombs, right? That's how ridiculous, you know, some people, you know, which is absurd, right? Um, but basically, um, you know, in any given, in this particular example, they decided, um, you know, they're going to have a network, but everybody's going to have two computers, one for connecting to the internet and the other one for doing their actual work. And if they needed to get a file uh, onto their work computer from the internet, they had to put it on a, on a drive and move the zip drive, these old zip drives, nobody uses them anymore, right? And they would unplug it and plug it into the other computer and copy the file. And if they needed to print something, they'd have to put it on that zip drive and walk across the office, plug it into another computer and print it out, right? Because nothing was networked. So networks certainly help us with a lot of those types of issues. Um, networks are great for communications, as we're all finding out in, you know, with uh, the pandemic here, as I'm recording this in, in the uh, tail end of 2020. Um, you know, com these, these computer networks really saved a lot of us, a lot of heartache. Uh, you know, we can all communicate, we can watch movies, we can uh, have classes together. Uh, all of this wouldn't be possible without modern computer networks. It'd be very difficult. Um, I have productivity here in red because networks really do help with productivity, right? But I also show it as a disadvantage because some people argue that having networks makes it easier for people to slack off at work. You know, if you think about it in the old days, if I wanted to read the newspaper at work, uh, you know, 25 years ago when I had a job at a you know, a traditional office job, and I went into the office, if I wanted to slack off and read the news for a while, I'd have to get out a newspaper and open it up in my desk, right? If my boss walked by, he could clearly see that I was reading a newspaper, right? Um, today, if I want to read the news, I can open up a web browser and look at it on my work computer. And if my boss walks by, whether I'm reading the news or actually doing work looks very much the same. And that makes a lot of people nervous, right? Um, so some people say productivity, but, you know, I would argue that if you don't trust your employees to get their job done, uh, you know, without having to spy on them all day, then you've got bigger problems, in my opinion. Um, so I would argue that productivity is definitely more of an advantage than it is a disadvantage, but people will make that argument, right, that it could go either way. All right, so let's talk about the Internet again. So we're going to kind of shift gears here and and kind of rehash a little bit of this, but kind of in relation to how the internet works. So I'm going to kind of meander through some topics here about how the internet works and some of the protocols that we use. Um, so again, some of this might be reviewed from other classes that you've taken, but we can start with internet addressing. So um, you've probably heard the term IP address. What exactly is that? This is what an IP address looks like in its raw form. It's basically four octets, right? An octet is a collection of eight bits. Some people call it a byte, right? It's really a byte, but for some reason in networking, we call it an octet, but it's just eight bits. Um, each one of those can be in a range from zero to 255. Here's an example of an actual IP address. I, you know, it, it, you can see it here in binary, but I've also converted it to decimal, which is how we typically look at these. Um, if you open up a web browser and you type in 173.194.204.138, um, I believe you're going to get Google, right? That's one of the IP addresses that's owned by Google and it'll pop up and it's going to be Google, right? Um, now, most of us don't want to just type in an IP address to find Google. Instead, we type in google.com and it does a lookup and finds that IP address for us. So we don't have to worry about that. And that's the domain name system that does that. It's sort of like the phone book of the internet. Um, there are top level domains that most of you are familiar with, things like .com, .org, .edu, and so forth, .gov, .mil, on and on and on. And when we go to a web address, it looks something like this. You start with the protocol, which is typically HTTPS, the S for security, although HTTP works for a lot of them as well. Uh, then you have a domain like Google, a top level domain like .com, then you have a path, and then a resource, that, a specific resource you're looking for. When we uh, 
when we go to a web address that's something like protocol domain TLD path, that's called a URL. And when you add a specific resource, that's called a URI. So a URI is when we're accessing a specific uh, resource on the uh, on the internet using the domain name system. So TLDs again, org, com, edu, and so forth. Um, and there was an example. All right, so next, a little bit about how uh, routing works with TCP IP. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about TCP here in a second, but here's really kind of what TCP, the challenge that, it, that it's trying to solve for us, is let's say you've got two nodes uh, and you want to send data. Well, I just told you earlier that with the Internet, you never really know the path that data is going to take because you've got these large network of interconnected networks and data can take all these different paths to get from one point to another. So I've got a bunch of data that I want to send from point A to point B. And the first thing you're going to do is you have to order those. You have to break that data up into little blocks. We call those MTUs. Um, so these equal size blocks of data. And each block that you're going to send has a number, right? It's called a sequence number. That tells you how, they, how, they, how to order those blocks when they get received on the other side. And you're going to start to send those. Now, those blocks can arrive in any order. They can arrive at any time. Some of them may not arrive at all. Uh, and you're going to keep sending until you get your first set of blocks, and that's called a window size. How many blocks I'm going to send um, in any given time frame without getting an acknowledgement back. Now, if I don't get an acknowledgement back on one of these blocks, for example, we didn't get an acknowledgement for sequence number five, but eventually this guy's going to resend it, and then we'll put that block in its right place, and we'll process that data. In the meantime, more data is coming in, right? More blocks. And one of the challenges with uh, networks is that how do you know? how fast you can send these blocks before you're going to overwhelm the other side and they're just going to start dropping these because they can't handle them fast enough, right? Think about that old scene with Lucille Ball, right? Who's uh, in the chocolate factory, right? And the chocolate's coming out too fast for her to wrap it. So she starts stuffing them in her mouth and stuffing them in her shirt, right? Um, you know, that's essentially what happens with networks if they, uh, you know, if the network isn't fast enough to handle this. Right. So we have to have mechanisms that can help us do that. Right. So we know how fast we can shift data in and out of our register registers to process that data. Right. So it turns out a lot of that stuff is defined for us in various standards. So we're going to talk about in this part of the uh, unit a little bit about some of those standards. But first, basically, we talk, you know, you'll hear the term Internet. You'll hear the term World Wide Web. When we talk about the Internet, it's the infrastructure or the highway. Right. How we get data from one place to another is the internet applications we use to work with that data or you know the, the reason that we move that data from one place to another is the, something like the world wide web it's an application there are other applications that we use on the internet world wide web just happens to be one of them here's an example of a web page right very simple uh web page but you know we're basically moving that data to access information but other examples are things like email telnet usenet voice over IP of that list. The two that are probably most common today, other than the World Wide Web is email and voice over IP. No one really uses Telnet anymore. Nobody really uses Usenet anymore, but there are other applications like SSH, for example, is one that we use a lot in computing that most people don't talk about, but you know, it's another application. So we learned about some of these different, uh, different technologies. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this slide. This is from your textbook. And it talks about the advantages and disadvantages of these different communications methods, you know, these different technologies that we talked about. So as far as the uh, network protocols go, I talked about how we have these different protocols that define how this stuff works. Um, you've got the Ethernet protocol and the transmission control protocol and the Internet protocol. Let's talk a little bit about how these work. So the transmission control protocol or Internet protocol. Uh, it's uh, kind of the, the, the linchpin of how the internet works today, TCP, IP, and also UDP, which I'm not going to talk too much about, but it's the other one. Your book doesn't really discuss it too much. Uh, but really, TCP, IP, that's where, you know, that's where it's at. That's how everything basically works on the internet and the World Wide Web. This is a picture from your textbook, which doesn't really mean a lot to me, right? It's, it, it's labeled as packet switching, but they don't really explain it too much. So I'll try to explain this in a little bit more detail. Um, so basically, the three basic functions of TCP is to manage the movement of data packets between computers by establishing connections and sequences the transfer of packets and acknowledges that they've been transmitted. And this is from your textbook. 
Um, there are four layers of the TCP IP reference model, the application layer, the transport layer, the internet layer, and the network interface layer. And I would disagree with this from your textbook. There are actually five. Let's talk about that. Um, I'm going to skip this slide again. This is from your textbook. It talks about this is their uh, basically their representation of how TCP works, right? But they're missing a little bit here. So let's talk about that. So this is all grounded in something called the OSI model. Every networking textbook in the world that I've ever seen always starts with chapter one is the OSI model, right? And they talk about these seven layers of the OSI model. And there's this concept of encapsulation where as you pass data through this model, you have uh, abstraction that happens that makes it uh, uh, simpler to, to work at these different layers, right? You can design software and devices that work in different layers and receive data from one layer and pass it to another layer without having to know the details in the other layer. So if I have data in an application and I pass it through the stack to the physical layer, I can pass data over a wire and then I can traverse it back through all these different layers until I, uh, till I end up with my data at the application layer again, right? And that's the basic concept. Um, generally, it's it's very simple at the low end, and it gets more complex as we go higher up the stack. Uh, you know, that's how most people sort of think about how these different layers work together. Now, the OSI model is seven layers, but no one ever actually used the OSI model, right? It was never really a functional network, uh, you know, uh, protocol that that really was based on OSI. Uh, what, what we do have is TCP IP, which is five layers. Your book doesn't talk about all of these layers like this, right? And I'm not sure why, because this is really the de facto standard for internet communications is TCP IP. Uh, it is a formal standard written in 1981. You can go read it. It's RFC, I think 793, if I remember right. Uh, it's been a while. Well, let's talk about how it works, right? So if I, I talked about this idea of abstraction, so if I have data, we'll call it foo, right? Just something I made up. I can encode that data as binary, right? At the end of the day, data is always at some point binary. It's ones and zeros, but we're just going to call that data to keep this simple, right? So we're just going to refer to that as data. And if I take that data at the application layer and I pass it down to that transport layer, it gets encapsulated and we call it a segment. So you put a header and a footer on it that has some metadata about what to do with that data. That's called our header and our footer and that's a segment at the transport layer. That gets passed to another protocol called internet protocol um, at the network layer and that gets yet another header and footer and we call it a packet at that point. Once it has the IP header and footer, it's called a packet. Then we pass it to one more layer where it becomes a frame. So it's another header, another footer uh, with more metadata that's encapsulating the packet, which is also encapsulating a segment that has information at the data link layer. And then finally, at the physical layer, we just have the ones and zeros that make up that whole package, right? That whole block, um, you know, of, of data. So that's basically how it works, right? This is this concept of encapsulation. So I'm going to talk about in this uh, in this deck here, I'll talk about transport network and data link. I'm not going to talk about application in the physical layer. Uh, physical layer is just not really important for this class. Uh, you know, this is not an engineering class where we're talking about signaling or anything. Um, but I think two, three and four are probably relevant and application. Of course, we talk about in other units. Right. So I'm not going to talk about application in too much detail either. We want to talk about kind of the. The, the minutia and the process of how we move data through networks with the transport network and data link layers. So when I talk about protocols at these different layers, there are protocols at the physical layer. Again, we're not going to cover these in any detail in this course, but you could go look up these different IEEE standards for physical layer in the TCP IP model. And then you have at the uh, network level, you have other uh, protocols like IPX and IP. And there are layers in the middle, like for data link, for example, right? Uh, so 802.3 is a IEEE standard for the data link layer. Um, it's uh, the MAC standard, right? And they can work directly with IPX and IP. There's also one called 802.5, which is IBM's token ring. Very rarely used today, but there's also a bunch of other standards you need to make that work. They can interface with these layers. But for the most part in this course and pretty much any networking course you would ever take, they're going to cover in detail two of these protocols, which is the IP layer and 802.3 MAC layer. So at layer two, we talk about data link. We talk about 802.3 MAC. 
At layer three, typically we're just talking about IP. IPX is very rare. Uh, very few people still use IPX. It was from Novell, which was popular back in the early 90s. Novell was a common network operating system, but they're not as common anymore. There's a few out there still, I think, but Microsoft has really dominated um, the network operating system market and Linux even to some extent. All right, so what do these uh, packets and frames and so forth, what do they look like? I'll start with, I'm going to start at the bottom with the frame. So here is an example of a frame. And in a frame, you've got a header which tells you the physical address. So this is like the serial number of the device itself, right? So it's the serial number of the device that originates the packet or the this block of data and the serial number of the device to which you want to send that little that little block of data, right? Um, so that's basically how this works. And it basically a frame header looks like this. Um, I'm sorry, a, a network header rather. So an IP header is gonna contain the source IP address and the destination IP address. And its header is gonna look a little bit like this. So let's take a look at this in more detail. So an IP header obviously is gonna contain an IP address. I talked about how these work, right? You have these different octets, which are really binary. There's this concept of class uh, uh, of uh, CEDAR addressing, which is where you use subnets to define the network portion and the node portion. Not too important for this class, but you'll hear this sometimes called subnetting. And basically subnetting is where you borrow portions of uh, the address that normally would be reserved for the uh, network address versus the host address. And you kind of, you can shift them back and forth, right? So the delineation isn't entirely clear. All right. So let's go back to the TCP model. So You've got the, uh, I talked about the data link layer very briefly. Then you've got the network layer, which is IP. And then on stacked on top of that, you've got the TCP layer, which is the transport layer, which supports lots of different applications. Uh, and that's basically how this works. There's also UDP. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about UDP here, but let's cover TCP first. So TCP is the transmission control protocol. If you go back and read RFC 793, again, I think it's 793. Um, but you can go read that. It basically lays out uh, six goals for TCP. One is basic data transfer. So a way to transfer a continuous stream of octets or bytes really, right? An octet is a byte in each direction between its users by packaging some number of octets and segments of transmission through the internet system, right? So basically how to transfer data from one place to another, but to do that reliably, right? The internet protocol is great, but it's inherently unreliable. There's no guarantee of delivery of data with the internet protocol. So TCP has to find a way to fix that. So TCP takes this inherently unreliable protocol and adds a layer of reliability to it. And then we also have to have flow control, that concept of not overloading other systems, but also sending it the fastest we possibly can before we overload them. So it has to have some mechanism to control that flow of data. It also has to have a method of multiplexing. Multiplexing is when we talk about having uh, multiple streams of data to and from single devices, right? So think about your home. You have one phone number in a house, typically, uh, if you have an old landline, right? Um, that's a single, you know, single use, right? If somebody else is using the phone, you pick it up, you hear the conversation. Multiplexing is where we can have multiple devices all sharing the same connection, right? So that's multiplexing. So we have to do that with TCP as well. IP does not inherently support that, but TCP adds some functionality or methodology to support multiplexing, supporting multiple applications at the same time. And then you also have this idea of connection. So reliability and flow control mechanisms that we describe above um, have to maintain some status to maintain connections between devices. So IP doesn't have this concept of establishing a conversation between two nodes. You're just sending data on the wire and hoping it gets there. Whereas TCP adds this concept of a back and forth communication where we can coordinate with one another uh, to communicate information back and forth, right? So it's this idea of having a connection, sort of like a telephone conversation as opposed to uh, sending a postcard and hoping it gets there, right? And then waiting for a response at some point. And then finally, there's this idea of precedence and security which is uh, not commonly implemented with TCP, right? So we won't talk about that too much, but there is some uh, there is some mechanisms in TCP for precedence and security. Let's take a look at an example of this, right? 
So here is a header in TCP. Typically in TCP, it starts with a source port and a destination port. So, you know, we talk about at the data link layer, you have a MAC address or that serial number of a device. At the IP layer, you had an IP address, but then at the uh, at the at the segment level or at the TCP level, you have a port address, which is yet another layer of addresses, right? Um, these port numbers, uh, turns out, can be anywhere from zero to 65,535 or two octets, 16 bits, right? 16 bits gives you a maximum integer up to 65,535. Um, so that's a lot of different addresses, right? Up to 65,000 of them. So in my example here, my source port could be 2,791. And my destination port looks like this, which is actually 80. That happens to be the port number used by web servers, right? Web servers typically bind to port 80, and they're listening on the address of port 80, right? Um, so whatever the MAC address is, plus the IP address, plus the port number of 80, right? All three of those you would need to communicate with a web server, for example, on a network. So that's going to be our source port and destination ports. Then you have a sequence number. Um, they're really big, right? They're 32-bit, uh, a sequence number, which is a pretty huge number, right? Because you can have a lot of of segments to uh, to complete a datagram, right? So so it's got to be a big number. We have to support all these different, you know, we have to support counting up these sequences. And then you also have an acknowledgement, which is how we acknowledge that we receive somebody's sequence, right? So every time we get this uh, segment with TCP, you have to go do a call back and say, hey, I got this segment, right? So they know that you received it. If they never got that acknowledgement, they're going to send it again until they get an acknowledgement. They're going to send it over and over and over again until you acknowledge and say, I got it, right? Um, kind of like when my wife asks me to do some housework around the house, she's going to tell me over and over again until I acknowledge, yes, I know I have to do the dishes, right? Um, so again, that's a pretty big number, uh, 32 bits. Then you have an offset, which is really kind of meaningless. It's just four zeros. And then uh, that's really just to kind of even out the next set. You have uh, some reserved bits, which um, are, I think, for future use or something like that. Then you have your flags, which are super important. A flag is basically how you tell, you know, I talked about this idea of connections, right? Um, this is how you tell somebody what you're trying to do with this segment. Am I trying to create a new connection? Is this a packet related to an existing connection? Uh, am I trying to tear down a connection that we've already set up, right? So we set these flags depending on what it is we want to do, right? So in this example, I might be uh, setting two bits to send, tell them that I'm acknowledging and sending a sing, sin uh, uh, segment, which basically means here's a new synchronization number and acknowledging that you sent me a previous one, right? Um, then you have the window. Uh, the window tells you the uh, the sender how much data they can send in a single segment, right? Before, uh, you know, that that's how we get that sort of, um, you know, that, uh, that concept of not overloading another system, right, with too much data. You've got to check some to make sure that, you know, the segment makes sense and it didn't get adulterated in transit, right? So if, you know, something got corrupt between point A and point B, the check sum is going to try to catch that. It's not foolproof. It's not 100%, but uh, hopefully it gets pretty close. You have an urgent pointer for precedence, a few more options, a little bit of padding, and there you have a segment header uh, for TCP. All right, so now we know a little bit about TCP. Um, I'm sorry, I've got uh, repeating my... Uh, so here's another example. This is UDP. Right. So UDP is very similar. You have a source port and a destination port. Um, and then you have a sequence number, an acknowledgement number, typically in TCP. But we dispense of those with UDP because we don't care about the order of packets. It's best effort delivery. You just have a length and a check. And that's it. Right. So UDP is very simple, very fast. It's usually for things like voice over IP, uh, video streaming, right? Something where you know, if you're worrying about ordering the packets, that ship has already sailed, right? Because it's real-time communication. So let's talk about how this is actually used in the real world, right? I talked about these three different types of addresses. We had MAC addresses, which is the serial number of a device. We had IP addresses, which is, you know, the logical address of a device on a network. And then you have the, um, the port address, right? Which is how you multiplex. So let's say I've got two networks, each with their own switch, and in the middle... I've got a router, right? And I want to get traffic from the computer on the left, which is a source that has the uh, the A in it, right? Um, F5AA, right? I got the wrong thing highlighted there, but you get the idea. 
Um, then I got a switch who has its own Mac address, right? Switches also have a device address. Um, and I want to get that uh, packet from the source IP 10, 11, 12, 13, all the way over to the right to 172.20.21.22, right? So to do that, I have to have a router in the middle. And basically what happens is when I want to get that packet or get that datagram from the computer on the left to the computer on the right, the first thing I need to do is I know that I need to get that packet to a different network. So I say, okay, I've got this datagram. I need to get it to somebody else on the network. They're not connected to my network, right? Because all the computers on my network are 10.11.12. something. So I know that this is going somewhere else. Now think about phone numbers. When I was a kid, if you wanted to call somebody, if they had an exchange that was the same as yours, right? Um, you theoretically could dial just the line number, right? And it would work. Well, that doesn't work anymore. But kind of to that concept today, you know, you have to know whether somebody is in your area so you don't have to dial the area code or they're outside of your area so you do have to dial the area code, right? And that's kind of the first decision point that has to happen here. I know that I need to get this message to somebody on a different network. So what that means is I have to put that letter into a mailbox as opposed to just walking it down the street and putting it into a mail into into a mailbox in my neighborhood right i have to actually take it to the post office so they can worry about delivering it to somebody else so i have to know the physical address of the first hop for that data in this case in this example the person who's going to handle the routing of that information outside of my network is the router they have an ip address they also have a mac address so that first destination address is going to be the MAC address of my router because, and you might hear the term default gateway, and that's what the default gateway is determining is how do I get this datagram to somebody who can worry about how to route it to another network, like a router that's going to figure that out, right? So first I'm going to go ahead and send that to the router, right? And that data is going to traverse over the wire through the switch. It's going to land on the router. The router is going to look at that datagram and say, oh, they really want this to go to this IP address of 172.20.21.22, right? Um, that's the real address. I received it because I'm the default gateway, so they send it to my physical address, but this is where it actually needs to go. They're looking at the address. They're looking at that IP packet. And then, there no, and then that router is smart enough to know, okay, that's my other interface. That's how I get to that network. Um, so it's gonna go ahead and encode that data. It's gonna mangle the MAC address. When I say mangle, that means it changes that physical address to the IP address of the machine that it knows it needs to go to. And that's the router's job to do that. So it's a little more sophisticated. It knows how to do that stuff. It's a specialized computer that can do that. So that's basically how routing and switching works. And I, I tried to keep this example very simple, but um, I know that sometimes this stuff seems a little abstract, but that's essentially how this works. In practice, in the real world, this can get a lot more complicated when we talk about NATing and proxies and uh, you know all kinds of other technologies in here and firewalls and things like that. It's a tremendous amount of infrastructure that makes this all work. Not only that, but typically you've got a lot more than just one router. You know, typically you've got you could have 15 or 20 routers that traffic goes through, right? It can be very complicated, and some of it's transparent to you, and some of it's not, right? Some of it's through VPNs and all kinds of other stuff that you'll learn about if you take a networking class or if you already took a networking class. So there are different types of network processing. You have distributed processing, client server, peer-to-peer. -peer. I talked about a lot of this already, so we're going to go through a lot of these slides relatively quickly because we covered sort of the, the groundwork here. Um, so you have the Internet versus the World Wide Web, which we already talked about, how to access the Internet, the future of the Internet, the World Wide Web. Um, you know, really, we're going to concentrate here in this last part about the future of the Internet and the World Wide Web. I already talked about how to access the internet, connecting, uh, you know, how do you connect to the internet? You know, we have these different various methods of connecting, right? We can use things like the uh, cable company and the phone company and so forth, right? Different ways to access the internet for organizations. Organizations are generally a lot different than, you know, private individuals. Most of at home are using Comcast internet or Fios or something like that. When you're a large organization, you have different types of connections. I don't want to get into the details in that in this class, but understand that, it's a different class of service with different terminology. All right, so here are the different connection methods, which we already covered earlier, but this is from your textbook.
So the future of the internet, experts are concerned that internet users will experience brownouts from three factors, increasing number of people working online. <laughs> We're, we've arrived there, right? That's happening already. Uh, popularity of websites such as YouTube requiring large amounts of bandwidth. And we start talking about things net, like net neutrality, right? I might ask you about net neutrality this week in the discussion threads and then demand for higher, uh, high definition television delivered over the internet and so forth. So the World Wide Web, the Internet, the Intranet, Extranet, these are terms you're going to hear, uh, you're going to see in the textbook and discuss. Let's talk a little about what these are. Um, so you have network applications um, such as discovery communication, e-learning and distance education, virtual universities, telecommuting, right, which has become very popular. Um, so network applications for discovery, this would be things like search engines, uh, publication of material in foreign languages and portals. Here's an example of Google Translate, which allows the publication of data in different languages. Your book talks a little bit about this. Um, you have commercial portals, corporate portals, industry portals, right? So these are portals where you can access information. These are common in organizations. Your book talks a lot about these different types of portals. Uh, you've got network applications for communications like electronic mail, web-based call centers, uh, chat rooms, right? Which is becoming common for support, right? Now they're you know, they got AI bots doing chat rooms now that try to support customers. Voice over IP has really become sort of the de facto standard for voice communication in business, right? Almost everyone's using voice over IP now. We're not using traditional phone lines anymore. Um, you've got a lot of collaboration that happens like electronic teleconferencing, especially now in this post COVID world, right? We've all discovered how to interact with each other and work together electronically. You might even be doing that in this class. You might be doing group work together electronically, for example, uh, using teleconferencing technology. Here's an example from your textbook of a teleconference room. This is a pretty sophisticated one, right? Most of us don't have a nice big fancy room like this for doing our teleconferences. Um, but, and you know, most of us now are sitting at home doing teleconferences. But there are lots of different technologies that can support teleconferencing and telepresence. You'll hear that term as well, um, you know, and, and telecommuting and so forth. So collaboration it has become uh, an important use of networks, right? Allows us to collaborate as teams over large geographic areas. We can communicate synchronously or asynchronously, right? Meaning, uh, you know, synchronous communication is when we have a teleconference where we're all talking together, but more and more, we're starting to interact with each other asynchronously. Think about your cell phones, right? How many of you, rather than calling someone, will send a text message because it's easier. You just have a quick message to get to someone, right? So you might use text messaging. It's asynchronous communication. You send a message at some point, you get a response to it, or you may not get a response to it, right? Um, so things have certainly changed a lot in how we communicate and how we interact with each other in organizations, but a lot of that is being supported by network applications. Some of the collaboration tools your book talks about are Microsoft SharePoint, uh, Google Drive, um, IBM Lotus and Jive, right? There's a whole bunch of other ones. These are a little bit long in the tooth, uh, IBM Lotus and, and Jive, but Microsoft SharePoint, certainly Google Drive. There are tons of other collaboration tools out there that people use to work together. You know, think about things like Microsoft Teams, and uh, which is more than just teleconferencing, right? It's got all this functionality. A lot of that's starting to supplant things that people used to use SharePoint for, right? Um, you've got, uh, you know, even Office 365, which is uh, does a lot of things that Google Drive can do. You've got Box for sharing files uh, in, in, you know, an organizational level, but then Dropbox, right? That a lot of us use uh, privately and so forth. All kinds of interesting collaboration tools out there. And your book talks about a lot of these. And then finally, we talk about distance learning. Uh, you know, a lot of you are doing this right now, not because you want to, but because you have to, right? Um, but I think all of us now are familiar with uh, e-learning and distance education. It's really become uh, the 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 um, preferred method of delivery for courses, right? Even my kids in grade school are using e-learning and distance education now with, with COVID. Um, and this is what's interesting about this is, you know, when I was a kid, um, when it snowed, it was great because you had the day off from school, right? And I think one of the one of the casualties of COVID is the snow day, right? There'll never be snow days again because everything can just be online. And you know, in colleges, we've been doing this for a long time. You know, for the last five years, when my classes get canceled due to snow, I record a lecture and put it on YouTube and students watch it on YouTube. And I put all the work 
on something like Canvas or Blackboard, uh, you know, or, or Angel or something like that, right? And students will, or Moodle, and students will use that, right, to uh, to access their classes. So, um, you know, we're we're there, right? I mean, we are, you know, a, a world fully immersed in distance education and e-learning, where this used to be kind of fringe stuff. When your book was first published, it was pretty uncommon. Today, it's uh, the predominant method of delivery for courses. Uh, your book talks about a couple of virtual universities, like University of Phoenix, which is all virtual uh, the California virtual campus, University of Maryland has a virtual campus. Now everybody does, right? Every college and university is delivering education online. So this is certainly something that has uh, that has changed. So that's pretty much all the material for this week. Um, you know, we we your book also talks about uh, telecommunication with uh, knowledge workers and digital nomads, right? Uh, so there's certainly uh, uh, some discussion of that in your textbook. I don't want to spend too much time going through these slides, though. I've already used up about an hour. And I know most people don't want to sit through more than about an hour of these videos. But as a parting thought here, what I thought was interesting is um, in your textbook, they talk about the CEO of Yahoo, Marissa Mayer, who when she became the CEO of Yahoo, one of the first things she did is she banned telecommuting. She said, everybody's going to come into the office now. A lot of people were telecommuting and lived far away from Yahoo. And she said, if you don't want to come to the office, you can go work somewhere else. Everybody has to work from the office now. My own employer did this as well. My own employer just last year uh, put an end to teleconferencing for corporate employees. A lot of us still work at home in other divisions, but for the corporate division, uh, they stopped work from home. They want everybody to go to an office, right? They got all this office real estate. They say, you know, we might as well use it. People collaborate better, all kinds of arguments for that. Um, but then COVID hit, right? Um, and I'm wondering what companies like Yahoo that ban telecommuting, gosh, boy, are they eating crow now with COVID, right? So an interesting discussion topic. If we were in class, we'd probably talk about this, about this concept of telecommuting and how uh, COVID has really changed that, right? So certainly an interesting thought exercise. All right. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, let me know.